Okay. Uh, greetings everyone for the new year 2022 and welcome to the first industry lecture of the chemical engineering department. Uh, we are pleased to have with us today uh, Mr. N.S. Venkatraman. Mr. N.S. Venkatraman is the director of Nandini Consultancy Center, chief editor of Nandini Chemical Journal and trustee of Nandini Voice for the Dis Deprived. Um, Mr. Venkatraman has over three decades of experience in senior technical and management positions in the chemical industry. And uh, he is the founder director of Nandini Consultancy Center, a renowned firm of chemical engineers and chemical business consultants based at Chennai and Singapore. Um, the center provides business consultancy services covering technology, market research, project feasibility studies, to chemical and allied industries all over the world. And it has brought out a number of research and investigative publications on various subjects leading to the uh, relating to chemical sector. And uh, he is also the chief editor of the journal, which is considered one of the best journals of its kind in India and well subscribed. Uh, apart from this, he is a founder of Nandini Voice for the Deprived which renders several services to the poor and downtrodden section of the society. And other activities of Mr. Venkatraman include investigative studies and uh, uh, organizing, uh, encouraging innovative and progressive thinking amongst the youth. So with those words, I welcome Mr. Venkatraman to the stage and uh, request him to share his uh, uh, views on trends and happenings in chemical industry with particular reference to India and China. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Mr. Venkatraman. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening to my student friends and uh, learned uh, faculty members. Today I propose to talk about the scenario in the Indian chemical industry, particularly highlighting the constraints and opportunities, and also uh, discussing little about the way forward for the Indian chemical industry to occupy its rightful place in the global arena. Apart from this, I will also make some passing reference to the scenario in the global chemical industry, in particular reference to China. And China has uh, remarkably progressed during the last few decades. And now it is one of the leading companies, countries in the world within the field of chemical industry. And uh, no discussion on world chemical industry is complete today without a reference to China. So obviously we need to talk about China and uh, talk about what about China has happened, or what they are plan future planning and all today. Now let us take the first the state of Indian chemical industry. If we take the Indian chemical industry, the market size of Indian chemical petrochemical industry is somewhere around 178 billion US dollar. And the share of Indian chemical industry in the manufacturing GDP in India is around 15%, 1.5. The target of the government of India is to increase this share of Indian chemical industry in manufacturing GDP to at least to a level of around 22%, in which case it will be a very impressive show. The CAGR for Indian chemical industry, the cumulative annual growth rate, has been around the region of 5.6% during the last one, one, or one decade or so. Now let us see where does Indian chemical industry stand in the global arena. If you take the share of chemical industry by, by different regions in the world, if you take 2014 as the base year, in the case of 2014, Western Europe had a market share of 34%. Now in the year 2020, it has fallen down to around 26%. In the case of USA, it was around 23% in uh, 2004, and it has now come down to 19%. In the case of China, it was 10% in 2004, uh, sorry, in the case of Japan, and that has also come down to 8%. But what is spectacular, striking, and uh, noteworthy is, China, which only had a share of 6% in 2014, has now touched around 28% in 2020. In the case of India, it was 2% in 2004, and now it is around 3%. So what really has happened was, when you say that the Western Europe share has come down, USA share has come down, Japan share has come down, Indian share has only marginally gone up, China has gone spectacularly. Obviously, it implies China's share has gone up substantially at the cost of other countries. This is something which you have to take a note of. 
this only shows how strong China has emerged in the global arena during the last few decades. Now, the, the significant share of China going up has been at the cost of others in developed the country. That's what you need to keep in mind. Now, in India, three states, namely Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Uttar Pradesh, account for more than 50% of the gross output of Indian chemical industry. These are three very significant contributors for the Indian performance and growth of Indian chemical industry. Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Uttar Pradesh. Now, if you look into the production pattern of Indian chemical industry, there are a lot of reasons to be happy about it. Because Indian chemical industry is touching about every arena of the chemical industry. This has not been so in the case of several countries. For example, if you take Middle East countries, particularly Saudi Arabia, or Qatar, or Kuwait, and all that, their overwhelming presence has been in the heat of petrochemical industry. Their presence is little in the case of biotechnology or the pharma or the sector. In the case of India, what is very striking and the noteworthy is India is present in every section of the chemical industry. That gives you a considerable advantage in the forging ahead in the future because you don't have to you, have, you don't have to start at a zero level, you start somewhere at middle level. If we take the bulk chemicals, bulk chemicals generally refer to products like uh, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, basic building blocks. India has a production market share 27 percent. In the case of the agrochemicals, which refers to fertilizers, pesticides, and all this, India has a lesser market share of only 18 percent. And in the case of these uh, petrochemicals, India has a market share of around 19 percent. In the case of specialty chemicals, I don't know. Specialty chemicals mean I would need, need to explain. Generally, the products which are produced in small quantity, which are high value. They are called specialty chemicals with some entry barrier in the field of technology. That means specialty chemicals are generally known to be technology intensive. Even there, India's share is around 19% of the overall production. Then other areas, 17%, which cover pharma, dye stuffs, and all this. So what is we should be fairly comfortable with is this the production pattern of chemical industry in India is fairly well distributed among the various segments. This is something good enough. Now, let us look at the performance of the Indian chemical industry, or rather the performance strength of the Indian chemical industry. If you look over the period of last five decades or six decades or so, certainly you cannot miss the point that Indian chemical industry has expanded and grown in several directions in the last few or several decades. That's good enough that need to be recognized. Then, not only the production of many chemicals have increased substantially, but India also have exported the export market in a big way to a significant extent. That is also something good enough. But the question is, are these progress good enough? The question is again, are these products progress good enough, considering the India's potentials and India's position in the global arena, and how in comparison how other countries have progressed? If you look into that, this is a very debatable question. We will take it up for discussion a little later. Now, in the case of pharmaceuticals, India is now certainly a world leader as far as the vaccines are concerned, which even the most developed countries have very generously recognized. There is no doubt about it. What we have done in the case of COVID-19, Bharat Biotech, they are developing this uh, vaccine, something spectacular, which I think oh, every one of us should be, need to be very proud of. At the same time, what is happening is, uh, apart from the vaccines, India is now a big exporter of pharmaceutical products. A lot of big companies are there. And what is happening is, what we are exporting in the pharmaceutical industry is more formulations like capsules or uh, values or syrups and all these tablets and all this kind of, not API. API is active pharma ingredient. India is still very much dependent on API from abroad, particularly from China. So the I talk that we do about the spectacular progress, progress of Indian pharmaceutical industry has to be conditioned by the fact that the exports have been only for formulations not in the APIs. In the API, India is not globally competitive. We are a very big importer. Now, given this is as such, in the case of the general industry, in the case of pharmaceutical industry, we are now said we have gone far, but not far enough. That is the issue. Now, why is the reason? One of the things that we need to keep in mind here is India is technologically weak. See, so students from IIT would not like to hear this, but this is the ground reality. The research and development efforts in India are far behind the advanced countries. And today, for setting up projects, 
we run to even small countries like Taiwan or Israel or South Korea to get technology. And we could go and get technology, not only for large corporates, even for a small, small plant, even for small chemicals, even for specialty chemicals. It's not something to be proud of. That is, today we are in a pathetic condition where new large chemical projects can be set up in India only to the extent that the developed countries or multinational organizations will be willing to give technology for India. In case the case of products where multinational companies or international technology licenses are unwilling to provide technology for India, we get stuck up. There are a number of products here in India today which you are not able to produce, set up, mainly because there is a reluctance of the international companies to provide technology to India or the fees demanded is excessive that India cannot afford. So here what we have to show is Indian chemical industry is growing but not certainly growing to the level of potentials of India. Now, let us see this another, another from the another point of view. India is growing, the GDP is growing, per capita income is growing, people's living standards are improving, people's expectations are also growing. So in the, inevitably in this kind of condition, the demand is growing for chemical industry, chemical products. A lot of products are there, a lot of demand is there, people want more and more chemical, more and more products. But the question here is, as the demand is growing, supply is not growing in tune with the growing the demand. There is a huge supply constraint in India. There are several products which are which people want, we don't have, we go for importing. So in such scenario, what is happening here is, India is now rapidly becoming a net importer of several chemicals. It is not something to be proud of. See, there are several chemicals which are imported in very huge quantity. For example, methanol. We are importing around 22 lakh tons per annum. In the case of the urea, we are importing 6 million tons per annum. In the case of diammonium phosphate, phosphoric acid, so many other products, we are importing to a level of lakhs of tons. Now, domestic, domestic capacity not being built for so many of these chemicals, in spite of the fact that there are no reasons for not producing them. This is a matter of concern. Why this kind of situation is something being debated across the country right now is a matter of high government's concern. That is why government has come down with new schemes like PLI, production linked incentives and all this. But still the ground reality is demand is growing in India. Supply is not growing in India. In view of these conditions, India has become a net importer of chemical that is issue. Now let us take the case study of certain products, what we call as the missed opportunities in India for investments. We will divide into so many categories. First category we will take is chemicals which have large demand in India but which we are not producing. There is no reason not for producing, I tell you. For example, in the case of acrylamide monomer. Acrylamide monomer is produced from propylene. Acrylamide monomer is polymerized to produce polyacrylamide. It's a very, very important flocculant. We are importing huge quantity. There is no production in India now. Another product is l lysine l -Lysine is an amino acid. l is uh, extensively used in the, as a poultry feed. It's a very important uh, input for the poultry feed. It is also used in the human pharmaceuticals. It is produced only from starch. We have enough starch in India. The process is only fermentation. We are supposed to have a lot of information on fermentation but not a kilogram of l is being produced. And in spite of the fact, poultry is a thrust area for India and demand is steadily increasing at 8 to 10 percent per year. Right now, India is importing around 65,000 tons per year. I have been watching these products for the last seven or eight years. Every year, to my surprise and to my agony, I find import, import level is going at 6,000 to 7,000 tons per year with not a soul in India creating build-up capacity for this. We we'll take another product, polyacetol. Polyacetol is an engineering plastic. It is produced from formaldehyde. Plenty of formaldehyde units are there. As a matter of fact, Indian capacity for formaldehyde production is more than what India needs. In spite of that, we are not producing polyacetol. It's a very, very important engineering plastic used extensively in automobile components and its variety of other areas. India is importing roughly around 60,000 tons per annum, importing increasing at 78%. We take the next case of polycarbonate. Polycarbonate is again a very, very important engineering plastic. You all know about it. And there are a lot of technology developments have taken place in the polycarbonate by production from carbon dioxide. India is importing roughly 1.2 lakh tons per annum of polycarbonate. 
The import is going at 15% per year. We are not producing any polycarbonate. We take the next case of polycrystal and silicon. Again, a very, very important product. Polycrystal and silicon is made only from quartz silica. Silica is available in the country adequately. The power intensity project doesn't matter. We can do this. Now, polycrystal and silicon is a very important component for the solar power industry. For the manufacture of panels, it is also a very important product for semiconductor industry, for the vector wafers. India is completely importing the polycrystal silicon. One project has been announced that is still in a preliminary planning stage. We'll take the case of another product, MDI, methylene diisocyanate. This goes in the polyurethane foam. There are two components, you know, TDI, toluene diisocyanate, and then the MDI, methylene diisocyanate. We are producing TDI in the country. Only one unit is produced in Gujarat. There is no production of MDI, and India is importing around 70,000 tons of MDI per year. So these are all the case studies of chemicals which have large demand in India, but India has never produced in India any time before, ever, ever since our independence for more than 70 years. Now let us take the case of another angle we look into that. Chemicals which are produced in India, but India is unable to increase the capacity due to feedstock constraints. A classic example of this is the polyvinyl chloride, PVC. As you know, PVC is produced from ethylene. From ethylene, we make vinyl chloride monomer called BCM. From BCM, we make EDC, ethylene dichloride. Then from ethylene dichloride, PVC is produced. Now India is short supply of ethylene because ethylene is a petrochemical produced from refined of this. And import of ethylene is extremely tough because of the nature of the product, hazardous nature of the product, special facilities that is required. There's a constraint in import of this uh, ethylene. So what India is doing now is most of the units are importing ethylene dichloride, which is a liquid which can be easily transferable, and they are producing polyvinyl chloride. In spite of this, India is importing 22 lakh tons of polyvinyl chloride today, and demand is increasing at 9% per year. There are five units already in operation. Technology parameters are known. Operational experience is there. We are not producing polyvinyl chloride. No new projects are very advanced in the implementation. We are importing 22 lakh tons per annum. If I discuss the same subject with you next year, you will find, I will say, India is importing 25 lakh tons per annum. That is going to be all the different. Now, we let us look from another angle. Find out the chemical, if we look into the chemicals, which are produced in India earlier, and we have stopped production, and we are completely importing now. What do you say about the situation? Let us take some case study of some product. India was producing earlier. India has stopped production. India is now completely importing. One is vinyl acetate monomer. It's called VAM. VAM is produced in ethylene. It can also be produced in ethanol and acetic acid. VAM has plentiful applications. One of the important in the field of adhesives. India is now importing 1 lakh, 2 tons, 1.2 lakh tons of vinyl chloride acetate monomer now in India. No new projects in advance in the planning or implementation. And we are producing two units are producing in the area in India. Both have stopped. Not only they have stopped, they are only importing. And probably they think they make more money by importing rather than manufacturing. <laughs> That's a very funny scenario. But let's take the next another product, polyvinyl alcohol. It's a PVA, it's called. This is also it's a derivative of the vinyl acid monomer. India is importing around 60,000 tons per annum. We are producing earlier, we are salt production. Another product is citric acid. We are producing early a good quantity, we are salt producing. Citric acid is produced from starch. Starch is particularly available in India. Citric acid is a very, very important product used extensively in pharmaceutical, in confectionery, and all this. India is importing 90,000 tons per annum, 90,000 tons per annum, and it is import increasing at 10% per year. And we are not producing citric acid, only units which was in operation that have been closed down. Let us take the case of the next product, styrene. Styrene is produced from benzene. And styrene in India's import is now more than 8 lakh tons per annum. We are producing styrene in the area. The styrene has been stopped. And no styrene plant is in operation today. And no styrene plant is under implementation today. And nowhere I see anyone coming forward to implement the styrene plant. And the 8 lakh tons are being imported. It's a very, very important product. Because styrene goes for polystyrene and so many other variety of applications. Another product, silicon metal. India was producing silicon metal earlier. Silicon metal is produced only from quartz silica, which is plentifully available in India. It's a power intensive project. The silicon metal finds application in the aluminum industry as well as as alloy in the ferrosilicon industry. India is importing 60,000 tons per year. 
no plant is coming up. The another product is called sea water magnesia. You have the set up a plant somewhere in Andhra Pradesh near Vishakhapatnam. The plant could not be commissioned properly. Sea water magnesia is nothing but MgO, magnesium oxide, which is used in refractories in a big way. See, in India, we had a lot of magnesite ore in Salem and UP and all this. From there, we were taking, uh, I mean, beneficiating it, producing called dead burn magnesite, DBM, which is used in the refractories. But over the years, because of the constant digging and the mining and all this, the efficacy of this ore has come down. Active ingredient content of ore has come down. So you find a situation that MgO, magnesium oxide, dead burn magnesite, produced on ore is not really qualitatively competitive. Next alternative is to go for seawater magnesia. It is produced from seawater, which we have in plenty. The plant was plant in the Masuri Patnam site there. It's the 15,000 ton per annum of plant by a group. They commissioned it. It failed during the commissioning itself. They stopped it. And nobody has dared enough to put up another seawater magnesia plant in India. And India is importing around 35,000 tons per annum. It's a very, very, very important product. These are all the case studies. Now, if you are not tired, I will take some more case studies. Now, we'll take a case study of uh, chemicals which are, can be produced in India, and the feedstock is adequately available, we are not doing it. It's called rutel grade titanium dioxide pigment. The titanium dioxide is a white pigment used extensively in paint, paper, textile, printing, shoe polish, polymer, variety of areas. And raw material for uh, titanium dioxide is ilmenite, I-L-M-E-N-I-T-E, ilmenite gold. It's available in Tamil Nadu, it is available in Kerala, in Odisha, and also sometimes some part of other Pradesh. India has got more than 150 million tons of illuminate availability, and India's illuminate deposits is more than 12% of the world deposits of illuminate. India has all these advantages. The world demand for titanium dioxide production is of 7 million tons per annum. India is producing hardly 40,000 tons. That means, instead of having, in spite of having more than 12% of the world reserves of illuminate, our production of titanium dioxide in India is less than 1% of the total world production. And now India is importing titanium dioxide. How much? We are importing 2,30,000 tons per year. 2,30,000 2, tons per year, I repeat. That's what we are importing. It is used extensively in paint and all this. Import is going up steadily at 12% per year. No new project is advanced in the planning or implementation. Now, leaving alone, I'll take one more type of case study. Now, from the future is requirement, there are a lot of project opportunities which India has to exploit, which we are not exploiting. I'll take only two case studies. One is olefins. I told you that India does not have enough ethylene. India does not have enough propylene because it has been bought by refineries and then by these very costly, expensive projects. So what they are doing in China, they are producing olefin, that light olefin, that what called ethylene propylene from methanol. China has got a number of successful plant operations for ethylene and propylene. What India needs to do is, we start from methanol is easily transferable, it can be easily imported. Bring the methanol from abroad, because India does not have enough methanol capacity. Set up number of plants in India for ethylene and propylene based on methanol. Maybe you can put some 10 plants and 12 plants. Because present Indian import of methanol is as much as 23 lakh ton per annum. Propylene ethylene is not adequately available. Both ethylene and propylene are very strong building blocks. Now, given this scenario, set up at least some 30 or 40 ethylene propylene plant. India can do this. We are not doing. Another very, very important product is dimethyl ether that is produced on methanol. Now, dimethyl ether is a fuel. It's an easily substitute LPG. It is a very, very eco friendly fuel. China is producing in a very big way. We are not doing it. Then, then algae biofuel. Now, India is short of crude oil, India is short of natural gas. So, given this scenario, India is importing huge quantity. We need to desperately find some alternatives. What is alternatives? Algae crop. Algae is crop is a quick growing crop. It contains 25 to 30 percent of oil. All you need for algae is ordinary quality of water, sunshine, and carbon dioxide as input, which everybody wants to get rid of because of the global warming. Now, algae is a quick growing crop. It grows in 15 days to 20 days time. So grow the algae, cultivate it, squeeze the oil out, take the algae biomass, then ferment it and produce methane and produce power. It's something like a comodino. It provides every part of this algae will be a great thing. We are not producing in India. In Europe, 
particularly in USA, huge advancements have been made in the algae biofuel now, and the aircrafts are flying using algae biofuel instead of the aviation petrol now in abroad. Now India is not doing, in spite of the fact India's tropical conditions are extremely good because what we need is the sunshine, what we need is carbon dioxide, what we need is an ordinary water, and this can be done even in wastelands. There is no difficulty in this. This is a, from end, one end to another, conditions are in favor of algae. We are not doing it. Now we are talking big about electric vehicles. For the electric vehicle, the essential component is a lithium ion battery. Now India is planning big for electric vehicles, it's a very tough target. And India is importing huge quantity of the lithium ion battery. It's roughly around nine, 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 I mean 90 crores per year we are importing lithium ion battery right now. Now only plants are being planned for lithium ion battery cell. What we are doing is we are importing lithium ion cell and doing the final packaging right now. That's around being 5% of the job. Now plants are being done for, uh, made for lithium ion battery. Good enough. Then to set up, operate the lithium ion battery, we have a lot of specialty chemicals that are required. We are not making any kilogram of specialty chemical. Lithium ion batteries are being planned without planning for specialty chemical, which are input for lithium ion battery. So what we'll do, we'll put, we'll, import, we'll produce lithium ion cell and then go abroad for importing specialty chemicals required for lithium ion cell. Specialty chemicals are like lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide, electrolytic uh, separator, graphite anode, etc. Graphite is plenty available in India. Nobody is planning for the specialty chemical for lithium ion battery. I can go on and on and on on these missed opportunities. I don't want to make you tired, so I will stop here as far as the missed opportunities are concerned. But I assure you, if you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the Indian missed opportunity, state of Indian chemical industry, you will find several other similar products where India should produce, India can produce, India is not producing. Now look at the pharma industry. I told you that India is a big exporter of pharmaceuticals, but API, we are a big importer. Look at the picture now. In the case of paracetamol, our import dependence is 30 percent. In the case of uh, metformin, it's around 5 percent. In the case of some products like penicillin G, our import level is 100 percent. In the case of levofloxacin, our import level is around 80 percent of our requirement. That means the pharmaceutical industry which we claim we are doing spectacularly good, it is spectacularly good only in the limited sense of the formulations, not in the case of active pharma ingredients. Again, import dependency is too long. The government of India is concerned about it. They have recently introduced a PLA production scheme to boost the pharmaceutical industry, particularly API. Let us see how it goes on. Now, given this scenario, what are the issues in India? I will just try to be very, very brief. One is the excessive dependence on import of crude oil and natural gas for use as fuel and feedstock. As you know, Indian import of crude oil is now around 230 million tons per annum, 230 million tons per annum. Indian production of crude oil is just around 30 million tons per annum. It's virtually static, it is stagnant, it is not increasing, doesn't look like increasing in the foreseeable future. India's import of natural gas is around 30 billion cubic meters now. Indian production of natural gas is only 30 billion cubic meters. That means 50% of natural gas we are importing. Now, there is no feasibility of significantly improving the production of crude oil and natural gas from domestic source in the foreseeable future. This is a matter of very high concern. And now, because of these crude oil and natural gas using, there are also energy issues like carbon dioxide emission, methane emission, all these are happening. There are also environmental issues. So, one of the biggest issues faced by India today is the import dependence of crude oil and natural gas. Common time India is aware of this. The so government is doing whatever is possible. Now, what are they doing? Now, government has decided to promote ethanol blending. Now, it has advanced by 2025. 20% of ethanol should be blended with the petrol to bring down the consumption of petrol. Then, they're going for a massive way electric cars so that you don't have to use petroleum fuel for that. It is going for re re I mean, renewable energy, solar, wind, and hydro. We already got more than 100 gigawatts. Modi government has not fixed a target of 500 gigawatt by 2030. That is what we are doing. This is as far as the energy is concerned. The technology constraint, I've already told you about it. India has become an import dependent of technology. Virtually, some people say that India is passing through a stage of technology crisis today. As I, I repeat again, in the case of several chemical projects in India today, India can set up projects. 
only to the extent the overseas technology supplier will be willing to give technology, otherwise we are stranded. Now, another big problem in India today is lack of export penetration capability. You have a lot of trading houses in India, but you don't have trading houses that operate internationally with officers, facilities all over the world. That is very, very important. If you want to enter the export market in a very big way, then you need strong export trading houses. Export trading houses is not like a merchant. It's, it's become very sophisticated industry. Trading activity is now very sophisticated with a lot of, uh, I mean, digital integration, uh, a lot of, lot of science and technology have gone into this. India does not have this. There are so many other issues. We don't want of time, I don't want to discuss. So these are basic issues that India is confronted with now. Now let us go a bit to the global chemical industry. What is the striking feature of the global chemical industry? Number one is, in the case of developed countries like Western Europe or USA or Japan, the countries in the case of most of the chemical, they have reached their level of saturation. A level of saturation means the population being nearly stagnant in the country, requirement of the country may be almost met. If the chemical industry in these regions have to grow, they necessarily look beyond their borders. They have to go to other countries or find a market. They have technology, they have capability, but they don't have people to buy it. The market is limited. So they need to go outside. That is why you find a lot of multinational companies expanding, looking for investments in China, looking for investments in India or Thailand or even African country. That is what is happening. And one of the important global trends in India, in the world, that we cannot miss. Now, second is, the important thing is, mergers and acquisitions. Internationally, companies, earlier, what we companies used to do is, they used to compete with each other. Now, what they do here is, they don't want to compete anymore in a counterproductive way. So, what they do is, they merge themselves to pool their resources and pool their strength and share their problems. A lot of mergers are taking place. One of the recent highest mergers I need discuss is, merger between DuPont and Dow. This is another very, very important development in the world, the mergers and acquisitions. Now, what is the focus of the multinational company world? Now, what is happening here is, now world multinational companies, world companies, companies with high technology intensive capabilities, what they are all doing right now is, they are trying to invent new world processes. Because with the, with the environmental issues being uppermost in the mind of the people, crude oil, natural gas became becoming a bad boy and people want to have a eco-friendly product, safe problem products, natural products, lot of biotechnology routes are being developed. Wherever synthetic products were in operation earlier, now newer biotechnology routes are being developed to become eco-friendly. Number of case studies I can give you. I'll just give you one case study, epichlorohydrate. Epichlorohydrate is one of the important components used in the production of epoxy resin, which goes in paint and all that. Earlier, epichlorohydrate was produced from propylene. Now what is happening is a French company has developed technology for the production of epichlorohydrate from glycerin. As you know, glycerin comes from oil, I mean natural oil, oil and all this. Now these companies have put up a plant successfully in Thailand. Now the number of uh, epichlorohydrate plants based on glycerin have been set up in China. So this is a classic example of switching away from petrochemical route the eco-friendly route, several other similar products like succinic acid are all being rapidly taking place. This is also one of the very, very important uh, focus trend in the global chemical industry. India needs to take a big share in all this. We don't seem to be doing it right now. Now, we'll go to the Chinese scenario. Having talked so much about this uh, global scenario, about the Indian scenario, where do we see China from? There are several things spectacular about China. There are several things bad about China, but let us see for both these the fair and impartial manner. Assuming that we don't count the European Union as one economy, China is the second largest economy in the world today. As I told you earlier in the beginning, China had a share of 26% in 2004. Now its share is around 28% in the global market. That is the level of growth that has happened because it's kind of a spectacular growth. China has emerged as the second largest economy in the world. Now, China contributes more than 25% of global economy growth. Mind you, I'm not saying global economy. I'm talking about the global economy growth. 
that is growth that is happening, 25% of the global growth is now contributed by China. Now China's share, the world manufacturing output, which was only 6.3% in 1996, now it is 28%. Again, we have gone a phenomenon. Now, with the exception of oil and gas, China is the largest world consumer of most commodities. That is, in other words, if China stopped consuming, demand for several products in the world will come down by 30 to 40 percent. The world can accept it. This is one reason why China, in spite of all its uh, negative uh, stance in politically or uh, socially or uh, democratically or whatever you call it, world cannot ignore China today because world co consumption more than 30 to 40 percent is consumed by China. Now, let us see China's scenario. If you look into that, China is the largest producer and largest consumer of aluminum iron ore, which are the very, very strong building blocks. And it is the largest consumer of most other commodities in the world. In the past 10 years, commodity demand growth in China represented between 50% and 100% of global consumption increase. That is, when the world's demand has gone up, 50% or more has been contributed by China. That's why China cannot be ignored. China's role in the international uh, trade, international economy, international technology is very substantial, significant. You cannot ignore this. Now, let us look into the fact. Just give it. China's share in the global consumption percentage. We look into that. We we'll, we'll take the case study right now. See, there are plenty of products we have put. For example, if we take this. Uh, one minute. Yeah. For example, if you take the case of the metallurgical coal, China's consumption is around 72 percent of the global consumption. 72 percent of the China's coal consumption. In the case of copper, China's consumption is nearly 45 percent. In the case of the aluminium, China's consumption is nearly 49 percent of the global consumption. In the case of hydropower, China's consumption is more than 25 percent of the global consumption. In the case of platinum, it's around 30%. It keeps on, keeps on, keeps on going. And in the case of nuclear energy, it's 5%. In the case of natural gas, it's around 10%. Because China does not have enough natural gas, it is important. So you see a situation that China is the largest consumer in the world, largest producer in the world for several products. And without consumption of China, assuming, God forbid, God for a moment decides to close China for a day, then you'll find world consumption will come down 50 to 60%. Whole economy in the world will go into a spin, high spin, negative spin. Now, what is happening in China? China has achieved spectacular progress. China's progress has been achieved. To which extent India has not achieved? Because China started the reforms in 1970s. India started the reforms in 1990s. In 20 years was the gap between China and India. But China is a totally different country where whatever the government decides gets done. There is no second question. India is a democratic country where whatever the government decides, ultimately people decide, confusion decide, nothing happens. So we are paying a price for this kind of scenario. I am not saying in a negative way. I am just trying to explain why China has gone in a spectacular way which India is not really able to do. So this is a scenario. Now China, what has happened was, in several of the products in China, because of the excessive government support, and huge enthusiasm of Chinese investors. And China, what China did was, essentially it was a communist country. Now later on, China opened up the economy. Today, China has three components. One is government-owned Chinese companies. Secondly, multinational companies in China. And third is private sector in China. Now the private sector in China is competing with the multinational companies in China in terms of technology, in terms of output, in terms of efficiency. Still, there are a lot of companies which were sold earlier. They were not operating at the best of standards. The olden days, many were polluting. Many energy consumption norm was beyond acceptable level. Many raw material consumption norm was beyond acceptable level. In the process, China created huge capacity, much more than China needs. Perhaps in case of some products, China's capacity built up is more than the world, the world, the world needs. Now China has understood this cannot go on because Beijing is polluted, and Shanghai is polluted, and a lot of environmental norms are there, safety standards are poor. The number of my accidents that take place in Chinese coal mines are the highest in the world, unpassed by anywhere in the world. 
there are several kind of negatives of china so chinese government decided thus far no further china's built up capacity is so high china can afford to curtail the capacity for the sake of fine tuning it that is what china is doing now i there are plenty of things the chinese government has done i will take only few cases for example industries are spread everywhere in china some are polluting some are in crowded places so what china decided was they decided to go and build up massive chemical parks now they are divided to four part super large chemical parks medium sized chemical parks small chemical parks and low low capacity chemical parks so companies which were having a turnover more than 100 billion rmb that is mnb they have to go to super large parks so they are classified what is remarkable here is after having taken a decision by may 2021 1168 1168 domestic chemical companies have moved away from the existing places to the designated chemical parks so they are all now in chemical relocated the chemical parks which china had done this has standardized the location of the chemical parks chemical industries are no more allowed to be set up everywhere and chemical parks have been there they are all integrated parks where all facilities have been provided several multinational companies have happily got into this chemical park company like basf has a very strong presence in china now they are expanding very rapidly now we look into the other picture look at the energy scenario in china now the energy scenario what is happening is a very very important thing china is a big consumer of coal more than 60% of china's power production is coming from coal and thermal power stations are notorious for their poor efficiency poor environment standards china is applying the directive asking these companies to reduce the consumption of coal to go by the consumption norm otherwise they close down and get out of this place as a result what has happened was several companies for power plants could not operate china has gone to see see the power you know power shortage right now that is one reason recently where production of several commodities in china have come down they have not they have come down not that to the unsustainable level significantly they have come down because of this there have been lot of world shortage of several chemicals right now but china government is not regretting what they are doing is they are restructuring it they are reading i mean uh, restructuring it redefining the standards and fine tuning it and given these kind of conditions china is now trying to settle itself not only as a quantity player but also as a quality player that's what china is aiming to be doing it fairly successfully now given this scenario now china see you have to explain and understand it is not only to the government support that china has gone thus far the big three forward in china is certainly not due to government support though government support has been spectacular government has given lot of loans lot of credit terms lot of incentives have been given but they have also learned lot from the multinational companies when multinational companies came to china in a big way because companies like vasf or dupont or dow who have been operating in europe and usa and other places they have market constraint they are not able to expand they need desperately market needs to expand and sustain china is a big market a growing market in the country when the economy of the country goes spectacular manner inevitably consumption also go up and the multinational company through china in a big way and what is remarkable here about the china is China has facilitated the smooth operation of the multinational companies. They all seem to be very, very happy because very few multinational companies, in spite of some recent political uh, condition between different countries, have moved away from China. They are all there, and companies like BASF are investing year after year after year. Several multinational companies are investing in China. Given this scenario, what happened in China was Chinese native entrepreneurs. Chinese private sector have learned a lot from multinational companies. The way of technology, the way of doing business, in day of management practices, variety of other issues they have done. When they are done, now they are giving a big competition for multinational companies. Multinational companies are realizing that in the long run, their main competitors in China are going to be private sector entrepreneurs in China who have learned the business from the multinational companies. Do you decry Chinese entrepreneurs for this? or you appreciate them for this they have learned from them not only that china is a very strong research center right now and now several multinational company like dupont have all shifted their research base to china dupont has got a very big uh, research center in shanghai 
and so many multinational companies are doing there. Now again, when multinational companies of such uh, dimensions, such, such standards, come and set up research laboratories in China, inevitably Chinese will be employed, and you can't prevent them from learning. Just like a consultant, if you enjoy a comply a consultant, you can't prevent the consultant from learning. He learns at your cost. Similarly, when multinational companies set up research parks in China, research efforts in China, employ Chinese poison, China also gains. So what happens today in China is there are several chemical products where instead of acquiring technology from abroad, Chinese companies are offering technology to other countries. And there are some cases where Chinese companies are offering technology to US and Canada. This is the kind of growth they have done. All these are very extremely good enough, extremely uh, interesting and extremely praiseworthy after China is concerned. So you need to understand the China gaining a great market share, China growing spectacularly, China achieving a big leap forward in the chemical industry is not without reason. And this has happened over the last several decades from 1970 by consistent government policy, consistent cooperation of the people, and China understanding the requirement of the Western country and create the right type of condition for the Western countries to come and invest in China and protect the interests of them. See, that's very, very important. China having allowed the multinational companies to get into China, they have kept their words. Multinational are very happy. They, they, have no, they are not being victimized. And China labor conditions are extremely good, even though of late there is some issues are there. And China's originally pay structure was very poor. Now it has factually improved. But then, to the efficiency of the person is also very good. Multinational companies are satisfied. And very, very few multinational companies are planning to switch away from China more due to political reasons, not due to technical or management reasons. Given these kind of conditions, first, then you have to come here and see. Take some specific case studies. Now, the world is going big in electric vehicles. China is the largest producer of electric vehicles in the world. Now, the, for the electric vehicles, on automobile energy, you need semiconductor. Whole world is now going through a big problem in the semiconductor industry. It's shortage, and China is a big player in the semiconductor industry. We take the case of the lithium ion industry, lithium ion battery. Lithium ion battery, one of the important components is the cobalt. 60% of the global demand for cobalt and cobalt supply of cobalt is done from Congo. And in Congo, China has a wise life grip. China is now having 70% of the control of the mines in Hong, mines in Congo. So China's supply of cobalt is well assured. Now without cobalt, lithium ion battery cannot go on. India does not have lithium, India does not have nickel, India does not have cobalt, which is required for lithium ion battery, whereas China has all this. And China has a lot of reserves of lithium, which they have got in the occupied Tibet. Now Tibet has got a lot of lithium deposits, and China is gaining big by this the occupation of forceful occupation of Tibet here. So everything is uh, exceedingly well shaped and well regulated and well coordinated as far as China is concerned. So how we need to react to China here is, we need to learn from China. There are certain things to learn, there are certain things to unlearn. Selectively learning from China will do a lot of good for Indian industries and Indian technology and Indian economy. Finally, talking to the students of this great institution like IIT, I would like to stress again, Indian industries, Indian chemical industries, are passing through a stage of technology crisis. I don't want to diminish this uh, seriousness of the issue. Of course, we are innovating. We are doing a lot of things. IITs are coming with wonderful results. Not only IITs, several CSR laboratories are doing very well. But what is the ultimate benefit objective of research is convert it to the commercial units. It must be commercially be exploitable. It must make the country stronger. That kind of thing has it been done. That is the question. I am not saying we are not doing. The question is, considering the fact that Government of India is pumping several thousand crores or rupees every year in research laboratories and funding the research and all this, have we done enough? There could be a lot of reasons to complain about the limitations, constraints in doing research. Okay, these are all our country. In spite of all that, there are always ways of overcoming this. I am sure the young, great students of IITs and other technological institutions and laboratories, our laboratories will rise up to the occasion and ensure that India becomes competent in all ways, particularly in the technology field also. Thank you very much, and thank you for listening to me. Okay.
Um, thank you, Mr. Venkatraman. Um, actually, um, because of uh, our HOD was here till 4.30, but I think he has uh, another class. And uh, so um, is uh, Professor Kishalai here? Um, so I think, yes, I think he is not here. And there are several professors, senior professors listening in on your uh, talk. Uh, but I think uh, they have, uh, you know, just as you've completed, they left without asking questions. I would have loved for them to ask you some questions. Uh, any questions from the students, please? Yes. Um, yes, raise your hand. Ayush Tripathi, you are the first. Go ahead and ask. Uh, uh, sh show your camera and then uh, uh, ask your question. Uh, good evening, sir. I have uh, two questions. Sir, uh, you mentioned that two companies failed during commission. Sir, uh, I wanted to know the reason. And uh, secondly, what type of technology deficit do we have? Is it uh, machinery? Is it process? I uh, like can we elaborate a little? The specialty chemicals, uh, as I told you, is uh, chemical which are produced in small quantity, high value, with technology intensiveness. And generally, specialty chemicals are produced in the multi-product facility because the quantitatively the demand for the specialty chemical may not be large. And unless there is a large demand, uh, economically viable plants cannot be set up. So normally what is happening, several specialty chemicals are put in multi-product facility with the equipment design, plant layout, and equipment configuration being done in a versatile way so that several chemicals are produced, the operators produce the same facility. There are plenty of specialty chemicals there, the field of perfumery, in the case of uh, flavor, fragrance, pigment, in the pharmaceutical, lot of there. I gave you a small example in the case of the lithium ion battery, where uh, you got the lithium chemical and then uh, you got natural graphite, the variety lithium ICF fluoride, a lot of things. Plenty of specialty chemicals are available. And you need to choose your area of specialization of the specialty chemical, which area you want to get in. And uh, it's a big way. I think uh, specialty chemical, I can't give an example now because so many examples are there. I don't know which to say, which not to say, and the vehicle, but the development is a very good area. And important for the specialty chemical is it's not capital intensive. So even young boys or young people without much of capital outlay, they can come into the specialty field, provided you have the technology optimized and ready for that. Probably the ideal method to do is a group of students can join together and put the money that is available plenty today in India and work out the technology and put up a specialty chemical and it will work out very well. That is a very good example for that. Have I answered you or you want anything else? Sir, uh, the, I wanted to know why the uh, commission like to come to plants fail during commission itself. Uh, I'm sorry. I think he wants Sir, you to had... know uh, why plants fail during commissioning. Yeah, that is a very good question. It happens with a variety of reasons. See, one of the important things before planning for the project is what we call as the market research. See, the market research these days is not like the market research done earlier because there are uh, not proper, like technology excellence is there. So you will have to ensure what is your level of technology which is competitive enough, number one. Number two, several cases which I have seen where projects have failed is mainly because lack of uh, pre-investigative study. That's what is happening here. The entrepreneur has to see what is his what, what is his strength and weakness and how he comes over, overcome out of it. Because in this case of small specialty chemical, you need to have a multivarious talent. In large companies, for example, the companies of 405 and the close investment, you have a specialist for marketing, you have a specialist for production, you have a specialist for technology. In the case of specialty chemical, particularly set up in a small, I mean, a small investment level, you may not have the kind of uh, affordability to produce variety of kind of people. So the entrepreneurs have to be very versatile. Many times, uh, the specialty chemical industry get into problem for two reasons. Number one, inadequate pre-investigative -pre study. Number two, it could fail, fail problem in the technology front. When you commercialize plant, teaching problems automatically come. When these teaching problems come, 
you need some capital possibly you are not uh, got your capital well organized so you do some two batches three batches spend all your money and then you don't have money for the fourth batch but three projects give three three batches give you problem and for fourth batch you know how to solve the problem because of experience three batch you don't have the money for the fourth batch inadequate money flow that is also there all these form part of the pre investigative study if you take pre investigative study so my session is don't be in a hurry to set up the plan take some time go for a deep study on all aspects and get into that when you do that you will not fail you have you have learned if i am in japan in japan is normally take when we very take for six months for investigative decision japan is taking out two years or two and a half years because they very go the depth to which they go for a pre investment study is very very high and the pre investment study is done carefully and knowledgeably i think there's no reason why any project should fail okay um right, thank you mr venkatraman would you be more comfortable if i stop the recording and then you can answer the questions yeah i have no problem okay i'll just stop the recording there's one more question